Robert Blake graduated from the State University at Albany in 1983 with a bachelor's degree in biology. He received his master's in the art of teaching in biology from Brown University. Dr. Blake taught in public education for several years. He came to Towson University as a member of the Department of Elementary Education in 1997. These are his reflections. Dr. Blake, thank you for sharing with us your thoughts about your own teacher preparation and your subsequent career in education. Um, this will help create a richer understanding of teacher education at Towson, what we do here. I think we probably should start at the beginning, so if you would, would you share with us a little bit about your early social context, where you grew up, when, where you went to high school, what kinds of career thoughts you were having as you went through school? Excellent. Yeah, that would actually be really good. It, it, it's kind of funny. Um, social context. I was actually, a, a, let's see, I guess I would call myself a child of the 70s. I was born in 61. So I was too young to be a child of the 60s. Um, I'm the only native New Yorker in my family, which is really interesting. They're all native New Englanders. Ah. So I am a true Buffalo Bills fan because I grew up in western New York, but they're all like Red Sox and you know Patriots and Celtics and all that. And I actually envisioned myself someday living in New England. I've actually done a lot of work there, um, taught skiing in Vermont, taught sailing out by Boston. Uh, went to school. I actually taught in Western Massachusetts for uh, a few years, so I actually mm -hmm. thought I was going to be heading in that direction, but that's just not how it happened. Um, it's interesting, I was thinking about that question either when I was either driving to work or not driving to work, uh, kind of how the mind works. Because uh, I knew you'd be, and I was looking at this, you know, why did I get where I am? Uh, it, I don't know if it's interesting about th that time of one's life, uh, that time of our society, but I spent a lot of time outside. Mm -hmm. You know, the old idea is that mom would kick us out, lock the door, and say, don't come back. Or, you know, get us dressed to go out in the winter time, and then we'd come back in five minutes later saying we have to go to the bathroom. She's uh -huh. like, what do you mean? I just got you dressed. <laughs> but spent a lot of time outside. Um, through, let's see, never, it, to be honest with you, never really um, thought of, a, of what I was going to do in a future through high school. Hmm. Um, and what's really interesting is I was a biology major in college and I had the world's worst biology teacher. Hmm. He taught by fear. Oh. Oh. Um, and his way of, you know, guaranteeing student success was through the fear mode. And oh. then my perception was if you, if he perceived that you weren't going to fail, he'd make sure you'd get out so Good you would grief. have, so he'd have a higher passing rate. That's just my perception at the time. Um, but you knew you were going to go to college. Oh, yeah, you had to. You know, my family, college was, was guaranteed. Um, guaranteed in terms of that's the next step. Mm -hmm. um, my dad went to college, had a doctorate at the time when I, he got his doctorate in 1964, so I was born in 61. Uh, he put himself through college at Boston University um, and also went to AIC, American International College, or, as they like to joke, almost in college. <laughs> um, and then my mom had an undergraduate degree, I believe, and I know she went back to get her master's, and this is actually the influence for me, the master's in teaching mm. or teaching science. So yeah, there was no, no um, question of whether we were or were not going to go to college. But uh, there was no, you had no sense of pressure from school or home or anything no. about what you would major in or what you would become professionally? No. And yeah. it, it, it's interesting because it, my dad was a professor, um, former high school assistant principal, and certainly I never envisioned being a teacher. And my mom taught for a very short period of time, but still never envisioned being a, a teacher, you uh -huh. know, a public school teacher or, or anything like that. It just wasn't, and for me personally, and again, I, you know, you can go back to the child of the 70s, you know, I, 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 I joke about it with friends of mine back from high school, sometimes I consider ourselves a lost generation. It took us a while to figure out where we were going in life, some of us. Um, but, you know, we've all turned out pretty well. Well, there you go. So, returning to college, so you had this fear-inducing professor in biology. Yes. Mm. Um, what else? 
about that? I mean, did you have teachers that you admired? It's interesting. High school, um, I remember my, f my first day of high school was a complete whirlwind coming out of middle school. Middle school, I was a National Junior Honor Society inductee, and, you know, I was the, supposedly the goody two-shoes, you know, and I guess I would follow, you know, the rules, kind of like my daughter is now. And I got into high school, and, and I guess things changed a little, uh, basically mid-70s, and I, you know, I remember teachers, none of them in high school, having that major impact on me. Mm -hmm. I, I do remember one instance in physics where I went to the teacher and I, I, I said, I don't understand, you know, mm -hmm. the, the classic, mm -hmm. I don't understand. Um, and he looked at me and says, I don't think you've tried. Whoa. And he was right. Mm -hmm. So I went back and tried. And lo and behold, I understood, at least with that particular instance, uh -huh. physics, of course. Uh -huh. Physics and chemistry were not my strength. It, 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 and again, it's, it's fascinating that I'm actually a teacher of science because I had the biology teacher of death. <laughs> I had um, a chemistry that was just really tough for me, and then physics. I found physics more interesting mm. than any of them, but mm. also I think that was senior year for me. Never an AP student in any of my coursework. Shouldn't admit that in public, but you know, it's just I tell my students all the time. You know, the ones that are right. AP, I'm like, wow, how'd you do that? Well, people get to where they are in different, different ways. Different and ways. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And I tell that to, to to students who are becoming teachers. You know, we're not all expected to be at the same place at the same time. Um, but ultimately, I think, you know, if you, you know, persevere and put that time in, you'll get there. But high school, you know, Mrs. Linden French, but, you know, I failed French one. Um, and this was really interesting because I had a sister who majored in French, and mm -hmm. she's, she's um, fluent in French. So in order to go to French two, I had to take French one again. I had a conditional pass. That was interesting. So, and then mathematics. You know, Mr. Nesbitt, but I never learned math. He was just a nice guy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've names. It's interesting that you remember names. Yeah, Chuck Berry, his name was actually Alan <laughs> Berry. We called him Chuck. And the reason I remember him is he was the um, advisor for the, the ski club, and I was president of ski club for huh. two years. But other than that, yeah. not a lot. Played baseball, did sports. But, you know, just a typical, um, right. atypical, you know, typical, non-distinct high school career. So you go to college. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Um, SUNY Albany. I did. Yeah, I spent one year at home. I grew up in a college town, State uh -huh. University College at Brockport, New York. Uh-huh. And um, my parents always wanted us New York, it, 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 if you don't know New York State, it, it has a tiered educational system. Mm-hmm community colleges, um, then it has two-year technical schools, probably like a lot of places, but it seemed a lot more organized than maybe others. Um, and then it had the four-year liberal arts colleges, mm -hmm. and then the four-year universities. Uh -huh. And at the time, there were only four universities, and that's as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know, not concerned, I think there still are only four public universities there. Buffalo, Stony Brook, Albany, and Binghamton. And then the rest of them, like Brockport, was a state university college. Uh -huh at Brockport, so SUNY. And so I went there th for my first year, um, but then transferred to SUNY Albany. And my dad likes to say that one of his, um, one of his six successes for his children in life is that we all went to a university in New York. My brother went to Buffalo, uh -huh. and my sister went to Stony Brook, and I went to Albany. So that's what he wanted. But SUNY Albany was, it was a good experience. Big school. It, I guess. You know, I, it, it, <laughs> things I didn't pay attention to. Yeah, it seemed big, and it's probably gotten a lot bigger. And what made you decide on biology? My mom. My yeah. mom's influence. Um, and the fact that I spent most of my time outside. Uh-huh. Um, just out, I mean, where I grew up, we we're the last uh, town. It's, while it was a college town, it was still very much on the edge of rural, uh -huh. um, and we were the last town in the, in the western part of the county, Monroe County, where Rochester, New York is. We were the last town on the western edge, and so between there and Buffalo is pretty much fields. Uh -huh. um, and so I spent a lot of time outside, had a golden retriever, a couple golden retrievers, spent a lot of time walking around, you know, a little kid with a BB gun doing that, just foraging around through the woods and the fields and 
doing stuff. Um, as I said, you know, we, we didn't have uh, cable TV. You had three stations that could barely come in. Uh, no, and I don't do it now. Um, I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on Twitter. So none of that to uh, bide our time. Mm -hmm. uh, some toys to play with down in the basement, but other than that, it was, what are you going to do? I don't know. Go outside. So that's what we did. And I just, I pretty much fell in love with nature. Uh, my parents, um, we were 10 miles from Lake Ontario, and my parents joined a small little yacht club, Brockport uh -huh. Yacht Club, and they did sailboat racing, uh -huh. small boat sailboat racing, and I fished in a rowboat that had a motor until I burned it out. Um, <laughs> and anything that I could do around the water, near the water, uh -huh. catch frogs, go fishing, swim, um, I did. And that's pretty much where I was, and played baseball. Uh -huh. I played baseball most of my life when I was a kid. And do you remember, what do you remember about being taught in college? Were there any, other than the professor who was kind of scary? Well, yeah, that was actually high school. Oh, that was high school, in, excuse me. In college, it was interesting. There are a couple interesting things about college. It took me to my junior year to actually write a paper. And when I went to get my master's degree at Brown University, I found out that students wrote papers in every single class from freshman year on. Mm -hmm. So basically I was a crappy writer. And you can keep that in the, in the tape, that word, because <laughs> I was pretty bad. And which was really tough because my dad was really good. Um, I remember invertebrate zoology distinctly. Um, Stephen Brown and the lab. And we always had live animals, almost always. Mm -hmm. And just the excitement and the time and effort that he put in to structure in our lab experience for us, really, it just energized me to really wanting to be, um, not necessarily studying animals, but enjoying the aspect of looking at animals and getting to know what they're about and how they live and, and how they interact. Um, and then another, I remember one time in aquatic ecology, I, I was like close to failing my first exam, and I said, hey, you know, I was always, I'm always a slow starter. I have, have been my entire life, and I told myself, I said, you know, this can't happen. Um, and then the next exam, I got the second highest grade in the class. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, those two classes, aquatic ecology, got us out in the, up in Lake George, mm -hmm. and we're doing water sampling and water mm -hmm. testing, and invertebrate zoology was just, you know, have a tarantula crawling up your hand, um, looking at the stinging cells that come out of jellyfish under a microscope and watching them explode. That was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, and you can do this now. A friend of mine does this with Maryland Sea Grant, but he opens up oysters or clams. And if they're really healthy, you can put um, carmine red, little red particles on it, and you can see, see the filter feeding process, these little things that are floating along their gills. And so all that stuff was just fascinating to mm -hmm. me. And so that was probably the most influential course that I had. And that kind of solid that I was a biology major at the time, so uh -huh. that solidified my my interest in biology. But the next question is, what was I going to do with it? Uh huh. So long about maybe junior, certainly senior year, we're sort of thinking, hmm, no, no, no. Still, 1983. I wanted to be a, be a ski teacher. Okay. It was interesting. SUNY Albany. Um, had a pre-med track mm -hmm. and then the rest of us <laughs> and I was not interested in pre-med uh, but at the same time I knew people who were uh, basically going for their biology major to, to be a lab tech mm -hmm. and considering how much I like being outside mm -hmm. there was nothing about sitting in a lab all day that interests me mm -hmm. and so basically I wanted to save baby ducks and whales Okay. Uh, but I found out that uh, most of that work, at least I thought at that time when you graduate from college, is volunteer work. Uh -huh. And I was trying to figure out, well, geez, you know. So I, I ended up coming out of college with, and again, I don't know, it, you know, we can go with a long story and, you know, go to the, the, the uh, family of origin and all that. But there wasn't any pressure to have college to get that immediate job out of college. Um, when I talk with my students in our foundations class, we have the, the, the notions of, you know, 
education, the purpose of education is for social efficiency or humanists. And the idea of social efficiency is that the purpose of your education is to strictly get a job. Mm -hmm. And I certainly had a friend of mine who's, you know, told me he's my age. I had to get a job coming out of college. I think my parents' point of view was more of the humanist point of view. Um, more of let's spend our time in college to, to really become that well-rounded person, to become edu whatever educated would be, um, and then let's see what happens as opposed to specifically getting a job. I know the one, the one thing I wanted to do coming out of college is I wanted to teach skiing okay. in Vermont specifically. Mm -hmm. And did you do that? I did. I did. I was actually told by a guy that I kind of idolized and respected who never went to college. He was a ski teacher of a small ski area in western New York. Um, he pulled me aside and said, just finish college. Mm. And so I did. And then in the fall, I finished college in 83. In the fall of 83, I went up to Killington, Vermont for their ski school instructor course. Mm -hmm. And they give the top two in the class, male and female, automatic jobs. I wasn't top two. Mm. But I told them I was coming back for a job anyways. <laughs> Um, and so I just showed up on their doorstep, and they gave me a job. Wow. And so I taught there for three winters full-time and then half a winter the next year. Um, I only did three winters because after three years, I was like, hmm. It's, it's a lot of fun. Um, it's certainly an exciting life, and I love the aspect of teaching. But not many people make a career at it, so I was thinking, what's my next step? Right. Well, what do you do in the summer if you're... Teach sailing. Ah. Yeah, it was, the, it was the time of my life. Actually, we could liken it to, you know, in higher ed. I made very little money, but I had a high quality of life. Yeah, I had a very high quality of life. Uh -huh. I spent my, spent my winters on, on in the mountains in Vermont and my summers on the water in New England. Uh-huh. Yeah. Very nice. So, but, had, you know, broke as anything. That's the way it was. So at some point you're thinking, hmm, this is... A wonderful life, however, there a however comes into that at some point. Yeah, it was interesting. You know, I came back from Vermont and got into environmental testing, mm -hmm. and which fit right along with my nature of being interested in the environment and the outdoors. What didn't fit is going down sanitary sewer holes and trudging around and poop and pee and, and putting testing equipment out there. I worked out in... Um, Rochester, New York, in the um, Xerox complex out there. And Xerox, like Eastman Kodak at the time, um, but Xerox especially, um, and it happened up in, I'm pointing because I'm thinking that's the direction. Jacksonville, mm -hmm. where the um, Exxon, Mobil Exxon contaminated the groundwater. Mm -hmm. Well, the companies up there pretty much contaminated the groundwater around the areas. And so I was involved with a company that would test the groundwater through. Um, wells that they had put in, the, put in there and we would take the water out and we would test discharges in the sanitary sewers and the storm sewers and all of that. And what was interesting about that job is while I was outside for most of the time and doing it, I was not around a lot of people. Mm. And, you know, I kind of realized that it, it certainly wasn't, I liked people. I liked being around people. And so my, it's interesting, my dad being a professor came across this announcement in his uh, college for the Master's of Arts in Teaching program at Brown University. Hmm. And I was actually in the inaugural class for biology. Really? They, they had the social studies and they had the English, so there were only four of us that got in in biology. And just like anything in my life, um, I was not a shoe in to get in. It was took some cajoling, some persuading, and basically telling Brown that, oh, he'll come with no, no financial aid. Come on, just let him in. Whoa. Yeah. Um, and I got in. So, and that, it, it was interesting because it really it was the ski teaching that pushed me into teaching. Hmm. Um, and I had mentioned a long time ago in this conversation that I never, never envisioned being a teacher. Mm -hmm. It was just not in, in my, in a, any horizon that I had in my right. life. But I had the background, the influence. And when I taught skiing and taught sailing, I found out that I actually, I actually liked the process, liked the craft. The problem with ski teaching and sailing teaching is they come to you because they want to, mm -hmm. as opposed to public school teaching, they have to be there. Mm -hmm. So that was some of the conflict. But Brown University was a, was a secondary, so they had a high school, it was for uh -huh. a high school program. Uh -huh. 
tell me a little bit about that experience. That it was preparation. rough. It was rough. <laughs> yeah, you know. It, Did you, you know. take courses? <laughs> yes. Um, and were they methods or curriculum? Brown had a pro Brown had a program where the first thing you do is you, you come in the summer. It's a one year program, uh -huh. and you teach. They they had what you they teach? called Brown Summer High School. Brown had actually a couple things. They had programs for the really smart kids, um, the accelerated kids, mm -hmm. and then the education department had Brown Summer High School that they would offer to the area urban students. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say they weren't smart. Mm -hmm. That's just to say by test grades or anything, they weren't in the, those accelerated programs. And so our job, I think it was for four weeks, was to teach. So right away we were teaching. Teaching what? Uh, I was teaching high school biology with my, my counterparts. And then my other groups, I think there were probably 15 in social studies, 12 to 15, and 12 to 15 in English. Uh -huh. Might have been fewer. But I know biology, there was only four of us. Uh -huh. And so we'd get a group of kids that would come in, and we would teach. Mm -hmm. And then we would also take classes. I remember we took ed psychology. I'm trying to think of what else we took. Did you take anything related to teaching other than ed Possibly. Probably a methods class in the summer, mm. possibly. You know, that, that's kind of fading from my memory. Mm. I know at psychology because my teacher is now the dean of um, the College of Education at University of Vermont, ah. Fanny's Miller. And I took it pass-fail because I didn't have the confidence in my ability to do really well. And I think in hindsight that was a mistake because I think I did really well uh -huh. in, in ed psych. Um, and then what you would do is between fall and spring, you would either student teach or take courses. Brown's system was you would take four courses in your content area and then one, in one semester, and then another semester you would student teach. So I happened to be in the, the semester of four courses in the fall, uh -huh. and then I student taught in the spring. So those four courses were in biology? They were. They were. So you're getting even more biology. Right, right. And, and which was and it, it difficult for me. Um, well, you've been away for, from it for a while. Yeah, and it was brown. Mm -hmm. And you know, I'm taking courses with undergraduate students, and they're, for lack of a better phrase, really smart mm -hmm. and motivated. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are people that could you know do, you know, fundamental mathematics in their heads, and I that's something I I didn't do. Uh, so when you have to do calculations, they're whipping, whipping calculations off in their head. You know, high achievers, working hard, and, and I struggled. There's no doubt about it, um, especially with the workload of that and trying to get ready for teaching. Yeah, I struggled, no S doubt about it. So I'm not hearing any methods courses of any kind. Yeah, we had methods courses. I'm trying to remember that when they showed up. Uh -huh. I know we had methods course because I know my clinical professor was... Um, one of my bigger influences, kind of a, a, a petite, older lady with a very soft voice, mm -hmm. very possibly, we, I never found out, someone might have found out that she might have had throat cancer or something, but a very soft voice, but um, came out of, came, and she might have come out of Cambridge Ringe in Latin, um, huh. and she, we definitely had a methods course, yeah, definitely, methods of teaching biology, because it was an MAT in biology. Uh -huh. And so, you know, it, one of the things she did for us, and I try to do this for my students now, is she gave us a three-by-five card asking two questions. Why am I teaching this? Why am I teaching it this way? And if you can fundamentally answer those two questions, then you're in good shape. If you can't, then you need to do something different. Um, but yes, we had methods course. Uh, I'm trying to, and again, I'm trying to remember exactly, you know, it was 1987, 88, mm. you know, the... Mm. That's so you think you had maybe had a methods course when you were teaching summer school biology, and you may have had a course before you actually went into a student teaching experience. Were you in schools at all before you did student teaching? No. 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 Hmm. I'm trying to think now. I don't know. So in the summer program, the kids came to Brown. They came to Brown, right. So you haven't really been in schools yet. Correct. And what was interesting is, is those of us that were doing the spring student teaching, some of us at the tennis is kind of a sidebar, kind of felt that we were second fiddle to those who were student teaching in the fall hmm. because um, Brown put so much emphasis on teacher education, teacher preparation. 
Um, you probably know this, but that was the foundation of Ted Sizer's Coalition of Essential Schools, and Ted was the chairman of the education department. Mm -hmm. And so they had essential schools in the area. Not all of us could get into them. I didn't get into one. Mm -hmm. um, but there was a, and this was 87, 88, and his book, Horses Compromise, came out in 84. So he was well on his way of pushing the Coalition of Essential Schools. Grant Wiggins was there, mm. the big assessment guru that everybody right. knows. So there was a lot of emphasis on the teacher prep. Uh -huh. So some of us who were taking our courses felt that we were kind of on the outside. Right. But it all came around. So spring semester comes right. and, you want, and you get a school assignment. I do. And where, where was that? Central High School in downtown Providence, Rhode Island. Urban High School. Uh -huh. Chose it. Um, uh -huh. I, and I'm, I'm trying to recall, there probably weren't a lot of choices, but I specifically chose that because it was so against, not against, what would be a good word? It, it was an experience that I had never had. Right. Um, so I wanted to go somewhere that was totally different than mm -hmm. what I had, and I did. I actually pulled up information about Central today. And I'm not sure what it was in 87. Um, the high school itself had an essential school component, and I was not in that. Um, but st statistically, demographics and socioeconomic status um, for that school were probably very similar to what it is today. Uh -huh. um, certainly low socioeconomic status, high re free and reduced lunch. Uh -huh. um, currently, the school is... is Graduation rate... Let's see. I don't even know. Let's see. Graduation. Uh, district, 63%. 2008-2009, They're predominantly Latino at the time. I didn't notice that as much. Um, their free and reduced lunch, their last free and reduced lunch, 2010-2011, uh, was 79%. Mm-hmm. It was African American students as well. It, yes, um, and I, I thought there were, at the time when I taught there, there were more African American students, but it's predominantly Latino, Hispanic. Mm -hmm. They listed as Hispanic, 64, mm -hmm. 63, 64, 67 percent, mm -hmm. which wow. I, I didn't, I probably didn't realize this, but um, Providence, I think, tends to be more Hispanic mm -hmm. than I originally thought. I remember a student standing up, and uh, an African American boy standing up in my biology class and telling me I was racist and stormed out of the class. I never experienced that before. I guess not. I didn't know what was going on. So this was your biology teacher. Mm -hmm. um, were you eased into instruction? Did you have a cooperating teacher? Yes, who cooperating teacher. Do you remember that person at all? Yeah, and it's funny you mention that. I can remember the face. Um, I can remember her personality, and at the top of my head, I can't remember her name. Mm. Um, eased into it, certainly had to do our full-time teaching. I, it's interesting. I look back at my experience, and I'm not sure it was as regimented as, say, our students get now. Uh -huh. um, but I know I taught two classes and tried to teach biology um, with the emphasis of, you know, this coalition of essential schools, student is worker, teacher is coach, less is more, that type of thing, um, with the notion of conceptual understanding as opposed to, you know, focusing on the content. I mean, because I taught uh, New York State Regents Biology in New York, and I took New York State Regents Biology in New York. And it's interesting. <clears throat> I actually thought one could teach the New York State Regents exam by definitions, facts, um, terms, without really getting into the content, you know, the conceptual understanding. And we were pushed to try to do that mm -hmm. um, at Brown, and it was very difficult um, for a variety of reasons. One, it's certainly a conceptual change for us. Mm -hmm. uh, when you try to get students more involved, the experience that some of us had was um, students that, ha that are usually told to sit still, be quiet, and be told what to do. When they're given freedom, they look at it as free time. And so there was this whole notion of we had to, I know the progressive educators or the constructivist educators don't like, <laughs> the, don't like this, this phrase, but there's some sort of, there's some training going on that we have to do. And of course, I come in in January, February, and 
And then one of the arguments, and I remember this having a conversation when, and I don't know if Ted Sizer was there or not, but our clinical professors, and, and people were standing up, when do we lecture? Is lecture okay? Because the, 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 the way you're teaching us, at least our perception is that we're never supposed to tell kids the answer. And what did they say to that? Well, they said, no, that's not true. You know, there are times for um, the telling and the lecturing. But I don't think it ever, at least from my perspective, never became clear until later in my life where that fell into mm -hmm. place and how much we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if that had anything to do with the educational movement within the eight, late 80s and early 90s. You know, the whole standards movement, and, you know, when math came, when the math standards came out, they were talking about, you know, trying to get more conceptual understanding and letting kids use calculators and not focusing on rote memorization of math. I don't know, maybe that's where it came from. <clears throat> but it, it was tough. We tried. We tried. I mean, we had limited resources. I'm sure. At Brown, I remember, or at Central High School, I remember once, the one classroom I, I was in was a theater-type classroom with desks bolted to the floor. Uh -huh. Um, and as you sometimes have in schools these days is you have a separate laboratory room and you have to sign it out, which necessitates that you be planned well ahead. And of course, as a student teacher, that was kind of difficult. Um, no technology really to speak of. No. Was, and what's funny is in 88, I'd go to interviews, 88, 89, 90, and one of the questions I would always get asked is, how would you integrate technology into the classroom? <laughs> and my answer finally became a, kind of a cynic and a rebel. I would say, when you get technology in teachers' hands and provide us opportunities to learn how to use this, then we can try to get it into the kids' hands. But before we do that, the question really is kind of a moot point. Mm -hmm. but, but the experience of Brown, I mean, it definitely was eye-opening. I mean, it set me up for, obviously, the rest of my career, for a good portion of the rest of my career. Um, then I got a job in 1988 in Western Massachusetts in Taconic High School. There were two high schools in the city. And again, had difficulty, you know, I, I thought I was going to be a good teacher, you right. know, in retrospect. Right. My clinic professor always told me I was harder on myself than my students, so that might come across right now in the sense that, you know, probably not as good as I would have thought I would have been. But well, <clears throat> I mean, you've just come out of a student teaching experience. This is, you're not going to be at your best right. the first day you step into a classroom as a bona fide teacher. Right, right, right. A real teacher. A real teacher. So I can understand why that would be difficult initially. Um, so you were in Western Massachusetts? Pittsfield, Massachusetts, yeah, for two years. In the same school, and is right. that ninth, in ninth grade biology? Is biology ninth? It grade? was. Let's see. I think I had yes, and it was. It was interesting. <laughs> it was. There were two high schools in the in the city. One was considered the good school, and one was considered the not so good school. Mm -mm. I was in the not so good school. Mm -mm. That was the comprehensive high school, mm -hmm. the one that had shop and Botech, mm -hmm. you know, and. If you look back at the literature of Jeannie Oakes when she wrote in the mid-80s about keeping track <coughs> and students that are in vocational and technical programs tend to be tracked into low, from lower socioeconomic status backgrounds, tend to get lower educational opportunities of quality. Um, there's not a um, push, at least for some of the students, to pursue college whereas the other school was considered the college prep school. Mm -hmm. so, and so, you know, here's your book to teach five standard class sections. Don't worry, they're good kids. They may not always come prepared, but they're really good kids. Uh -huh. That's kind of like the... Did know, you have comparable equipment in both schools? I mean, did you feel as though <coughs> you also got kind of the short end on... I don't remember. Those? You don't. I know we, we, we had equipment, uh -huh. definitely. Yeah, we were able, we had what we needed to teach biology, or at least to try to teach biology. Um, I can't recall. I mean, sure, maybe the rumor was out there that we didn't, but I don't think that was true. Mm. So, what are you thinking about your your choice of careers in these two years when you're out on your own as a beginning teacher? Yeah, I I actually liked it. The stress level for me was always high. Uh huh. Um, and it, and for public school teachers, at least for my personality, um, 
because no matter what happens, the students are going to show up to class. So whether you're prepared or not, whether you're, you're ready to go, whether you have everything ready, and of course science, not that I want to um, diminish any other discipline, but science lent itself to, you have to get a lot of stuff together. So there's a lot of behind the scenes mm -hmm. organization. Mm -hmm. So it's very stressful. Teaching's always been stressful for me because I have, in my mind, I want to be perfect, but it's never possible. And so planning was always tough for me because I would always deconstruct something and then try to rebuild it. Right. And I didn't necessarily need to do that. Um, classroom management was my biggest issue. I ne we never had anything on classroom management, and you know my conflict resolution model was not one that would work well in classrooms. You know, being forceful and telling kids to be quiet and sit uh -huh. down, or you know the whole punishment. Right. So, but um, really tried to get engage the kids. Tried to do as many what people would call lab or non lab, but activities engaging, trying to get them involved, critical thinking. I mean, that was the attempt. Yeah. And Bob, there was no mentoring for you for new teachers? In not really, kind of. System-wide really. or in mm -hmm. the school itself? No. The one good thing that happened is between my first year and second year, a woman came in by the name of Lois Dorso and involved my colleague and I in um, putting together curricula based on a constructivist learning model. And so we actually spent the summer writing curriculum, our own curriculum, kind, uh -huh. of, fu kind of funny, based off the three-part learning cycle of explore, concept introduction, concept application. So, and that meshed really well with the philosophy out of Brown, with the student as worker, teacher as coach, <clears throat> less is more, conceptual understanding, engage the kids, get them doing, get them involved. So the constructivist learning model um, between those two things really formed a solid foundation for the rest of my teaching career, um, even to today. Experiential learning. Um, I still had to struggle with where the, I joke with my students these days, you know, do you remember um, Little Mermaid? Mm -hmm. You know, Flounder. He says, and this seagull came around and said, this is this, that is that. I refer to that <laughs> as the lecture. You know, somewhere along the line, our job as a teacher is we have to go in there and do that. Uh -huh. um, and a constructivist learning model does not negate that, but the interpretation is we just facilitate, whatever that is. So that really helped out. We wrote our own curriculum. Um, we really tried to implement it. We tried to engage the kids in out, outside activities, tried to engage them in, in looking towards, we put a science club together, engage them towards thinking what science career they could possibly do. Interesting, though, in Massachusetts at the time, that was the Michael Dukakis election, mm. and it's not his fault, but, you know, another, that was kind of a recession. So first in, last, last in, first to leave. I always got pink slips. The second year, I never got a hire back, so I had to find another job. Mm. And I got a high school teaching job down in Terrytown, New York, right on the Hudson River. Mm -hmm. And basically went from kind of a city rural, and I would say that combination city-rural area to basic an urban area. Right. Um, that was Terrytown, mm -hmm. the old GM plant there, right, right there by the Tappan Zee Bridge. Yep. yep. That's yeah. about as urban as you can get. Yep. And taught general science and biology. And, and how long got were you there? One year. Mm -hmm. And again, it was the issue of, it was interesting, I was looking at my career at that time, my sister was in Chicago, uh, mm -hmm. beginning a doctorate program mm -hmm. in University of Illinois, Chicago. Mm -hmm. She had a two-year-old son, one-year-old, two-year-old, probably one-year-old. And I, it started to pique my curiosity mm -hmm. about pursuing a Ph.D. Um, and for me, it, it would serve two purposes. One, because I was teaching science, a Ph.D. necessitates that you do research. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I thought that by going out and doing research, it would better enable me to be a better teacher of science. Um, and then the other one was I, I was thinking that it would set me up for the rest of my life in terms of depending on what I wanted to do in teaching. Mm -hmm. I hadn't really considered higher education. And again, my dad was a higher ed person right. and a teacher. Yes. Neither my sister nor I and my brother had any inkling that that's where <laughs> we were going to go. And for her, both my sister and me, that's where we went. Uh -huh. We ended up in higher ed. Uh -huh. So something. Yeah. So I ended up, and it's, it's interesting. I was offered a job in 
northern New Jersey. Beautiful town, beautiful school. <clears throat> Would have been perfect. I was offered to, a job to set up this environmental science program. They really liked me. Um, they came and visited me and watched me teach and everything. And I said no. I took the chance of going to University of Illinois Chicago, uh, packed up my car, drove out to Chicago in a little uh, Subaru wagon. Never, I've only been to Chicago once before. And said, here I am. Yeah. Actually, twice before. I said, here I am. I'm, I'm ready to uh -huh. start a doctoral program. Uh huh. And that was going to be in curriculum and instruction? Yes, technically yeah. it was curriculum and instruction. Okay. I like to lie and tell them it was science education. They didn't have any <laughs> science education. But that was my emphasis. That was the closest thing. Right. It was C&I. Uh-huh. Yep. And they had some science educators around. They used to have one, John Staver, who um, actually moved to Kansas State University and was director of their Center for Science and Mathematics Education. Um, he was actually chairman of the board that in Kansas that rewrote the science standards to get evolution back in. It's kind of funny, <laughs> um, the state science standards. Um, and I drove down to Manhattan, Kansas from Chicago, considering transferring to Manhattan, Kansas. Huh. And I looked at Manhattan, Kansas, and it's beautiful, beautiful territory. Uh -huh. But if you remember, I sail, uh -huh. Chicago, Lake Michigan, uh -huh. Kansas. Kansas. And Kansas was beautiful, but I stayed in Chicago. Uh -huh. So tell me about your education there what you learned, um, how that's influenced your thinking. Interesting. I'm trying to think, you know, it's like one of the first professors I ever had, Bill Schubert, curriculum, I don't know what you would call him, curriculum guru, he's been around forever, he's now retired. His fundamental questions were, what is most worthwhile to learn and experience? And I thought the guy was off his rocker. <laughs> you know, his last class, he handed everybody an inanimate object and said, how would you structure the, um, a lesson around this? And I got a glue stick. <laughs> and I said, like, this is the stupidest thing I've ever seen. Uh -huh. But at the same time, what it did is it immersed me in the literature, um, and it immersed me in... Um, discussing what is important in teaching. I, mm -hmm. I do remember quite clearly being a thorn in a lot of my professor's sides, or at uh -huh. least I thought I was a thorn, uh -huh. because we would, we would have these seminar-type um, classrooms, and I'd look around this room, we'd all be sitting around these big tables, and uh -huh. people would be talking and pontificating, and as you know, the same people always talk. Uh -huh. And me, it'd be like, well, but what does this all have to do with classroom practice? Mm -hmm. What impact are you going to have on teachers teaching? Um, it was a question I always asked. It's a legitimate question. I never really got a good answer. Um, but that's actually the direction my, my research study went in. Oh. I did get involved with a nationally recognized program <clears throat> in, called the Teaching, Integrating, and Math Science Program, TIMS, not to be mistaken with the testing, put together by a mathematician and a physicist. And their approach was we needed to have this integration of mathematics and science, and that we use the scientific process as a means of understanding mathematics. And so we use the scientific process for data collection starting at grade one, right. all the way up through middle school, <clears throat> and then using data collection, data organization, and then data interpretation. And at first, <clears throat> I was somewhat resistant to their push for quantitative, 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 because mm -hmm. I was still more that, I was a science person, but I was still more of the holistic. Mm -hmm. But in hindsight, 20 some odd years later, um, it, yeah, it takes me, took me, remember, I'm a <laughs> slow starter. Um, it, it definitely made an impression on me. Mm -hmm. I mean, because you can engage little kids, I have a two-year-old, and at first grade, you can engage them in, in data collection. I was more interested in the holistic, like, let's look, at, let's look at earthworms and play with earthworms and see what their body structures are like. Let's look at their behavior. Let's look at mealworms. I wasn't necessarily into um, asking about the relationships between variables. If I, if I have a ramp, how, when I raise the height of the ramp, how does that impact the distance a car goes? Or if I have a bouncing ball, 
if I raise the height of dropping the ball, how high will it bounce? And, and be, with those two experiments, you basically get um, the power of data collection and, and data interpretation because you get straight line graphs. And so then you can start interpreting um, from your graph with data that you never even collected because the graph, you have that direct relationship between, right. you know, if I drop the ball from two feet, well, we obviously metric because remember the big push in metric in the 70s. If I drop the ball, say, from three feet, a super ball bounces two feet and a tennis ball bounces one foot. Well, that's consistent throughout, so you get this nice straight line. So mm -hmm. now you can do interpolation, extrapolation, and things like that. And it's just the power of that. So that actually, once I really started thinking about combining those two approaches, the holistic, the, the behavior, looking at the organisms, plus the data collection, um, things started coming together for me a little better in terms of trying to teach science. Somehow you started um, your interest, and I'm not quite certain how this happened, um, was focusing on early early read uh, early learners. So you were looking at elementary age teaching, <clears throat> in addition to high school biology. Go figure. And you come in with high school biology, right. And come out of that doctoral program, and it's a it's a broader yeah. kind of application Go or figure. understanding. Yeah. I. Um, yeah, and I'm in the elementary education department, go figure. Because mm -hmm. when I got out of the program at um, University of Illinois Chicago, I went back to teach middle school, okay. which actually was probably the best thing that ever happened to uh -huh. me. One of the best things, because it, it, it allowed me to actually get into an elementary education department that back in 1997 had this notion that they were going to pursue middle school, which didn't happen for 12 years, until 12 <laughs> years later. Um, it, very interesting. The re, my research was in a sixth grade classroom, mm -hmm. which by certification realm is elementary. But really, it was, and it was in an elementary school in Chicago. Um, and it was, yeah, sixth grade. Was it sixth grade? Fifth. See, look at this. My dissertation, I'm forgetting. I think it was fifth. It was fifth grade. And, uh, you know, technically that's upper elementary, mm -hmm. but still elementary. And that's mm -hmm. what got me in there. But what was interesting is we were having this conversation yesterday, in our, let's say Wednesday, Monday, in our elementary education department meeting. We are having this conversation about a new evaluation system for our students compared to an older evaluation system of a portfolio. Mm -hmm. And I liken it to what's going on right now with the new Common Core standards and then the testing. Mm -hmm. Even back in the 90s, in all the reading I did in my doctoral program, I saw a heavy emphasis on curriculum, certainly in the sciences from the 60s and the 70s, what are we going to teach the kids, to how well they did the test, mm -hmm. and ignored pretty much everything in between, mm -hmm. which was called teaching. Mm -hmm. And I thought that to be quite spectacular, that there was, and I probably could have been wrong, but there there was not a lot of information on really what good teachers are doing in the classroom. It was more the, let's get the right curriculum, and then let's test them. But let's not pay attention to what t real teachers are doing. So that's where my focus was. Um, and that's where I've pretty much been ever since, is what's going on in the classroom. And now, and, and I think you mentioned this whole notion of how, how did I get from, it's interesting, because you know, you gotta be careful what you say. <laughs> um, Bill Schubert started out as an elementary teacher. Oh. And he actually... Um, Interesting. Yeah, and of course someone made some comment and then that, you know, if you're a high school teacher, you can always go down to elementary, but if you're in elementary, you can't go up. And I probably said that to him. I'm surprised he even talks to me anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, I ended up going in elementary, and now I'm, I, I try to champion science teaching in elementary school probably not doing a good job of it but since it doesn't get taught but it's interesting how I came from a high school to a middle school teacher to an elementary education department. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so here you've been at Towson you came in 1997. 97. And what kinds of things have you been doing? Wow for a long time. Um, it's interesting I was brought in in a job description that I had to rummage up at one point <laughs> to, to reinforce to my bosses in the College of Education that I was brought in here to teach science mm -hmm. and to bridge 
between the College of Science and Mathematics, where all our science methods courses are, right. and the College of Education. And so at that time, we had a, they had, I didn't have anything to do with it, and they had a, an NSF-funded program called the Maryland Collaborative Teacher Preparation, which was taking elementary education students and giving them special attention in constructivist learning model pedagogy in addition to mathematics and science content understanding. And science and mathematics and science content understanding that was changed, the courses were supposed to represent a constructivist model in terms of how they taught, meaning the professors, mm -hmm. as opposed to a traditional college model of right. lecture, rote memorization. And I got involved with that and then ended up running what I'm pretty sure was the first professional development school in the state that emphasized science. It was environmental science up in Hartford County. Uh -huh. And so I was involved, and it was elementary. Uh -huh. But it was elementary slash middle, which is where that middle school experience, right. which got me in the door, I think. Um, and you were on faculty then. Mm -hmm. I was. Um, I can't remember what department, but. Um, the name of my department changed over time. It's, it's gone. <laughs> but I was interviewed by both both science and um, mm -hmm. elementary education people. Uh -huh. when, so you, when you when came, I came in here. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so that's where I started uh, between the two colleges. Uh -huh. I was out in the field doing student teaching supervision, trying to do uh, initially student teaching supervision, and then got involved with the science education, the science component, got involved with that, got involved with the um, secondary science methods which was, hmm. to a certain extent, um, non-existent. It was existent, but they didn't have a consistent person there. Right. We were known um, for not for having a secondary education science program, but having no dedicated faculty for secondary science education. So anybody who was involved, at least from the College of Ed side, was an elementary ed um, at, at best. Um, so I got involved with that and ran professional development school um, but when you're running a PDS, you're not focusing only on science, but we did that. We, I got an Eisenhower grant at the time to engage faculty, school-based faculty, and interns in uh, what would be considered project-based learning. Uh, one of the schools I worked with, William S. James, that was their focus, project-based learning. Um, asking um, overarching driving questions to, to run the, the school year. Their, their driving question for their entire year at the school was, how can we save the Chesapeake Bay? Kind of a broad, you know, <laughs> save baby ducks and whales uh -huh. question, but, and they tried to integrate that throughout their curriculums. And so we would engage with, we would run workshops, we would get, in, get involved with um, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and trips with them, um, and then realized that we could do our own stuff, we, meaning a few of us who were involved in it. And so continue to pursue, once I got out of PDS, I was involved in the science education and then also in the elementary education foundations courses. Mm -hmm. Not a great, not a word I really like, foundations, but really the course is foundational to everything else. <laughs> I like to, I like to call it now um, historical and contemporary issues in education. And then from that came uh, the first major book that we published, uh, the Inside Out book through NSTA Press, National Science Teachers Association Press, which focused on getting kids and teachers um, moving from inside the classroom to outside and investigating the environment around them. Mm -hmm. So that, that book was interesting because that was actually, a, it came out in 2010, it was a culmination of pretty much my whole time from 97 to 2010. You would think I'd have more to show for no. my well, 13 years, but. Not necessarily. I haven't read the book, so I don't know. But it might be over that period of time, it sounds like you've been involved in a, a variety of curricular considerations and um, instructional methodologies right. and so I think one of the things I would love to hear more about is where that's landed you that that sort of journey you've taken here in a variety of different ways in terms of um, how do we prepare teachers of science especially at the elementary level? I mean, Tough questions. You Boy, you're, you're kind of like the Terry Gross of um, I'm sorry. oral, oral I'm history sorry. here. Yeah. Well, I like Terry I'm Gross. Just, so. Yeah, and I'm not saying that this is the definitive answer because we know that there never is a definitive answer and it is somewhat 
it, situational? I mean, it's, a, it's a great question because where has it landed us, me specifically, but well, us in the yes. teaching of science yes. in the elementary classroom? I guess. Yeah. Um, currently, as acting chair of the department, unfortunately, my um, duties have pulled me out of teaching. Mm -hmm. and one of them being, you know, I'm no longer in the field teaching, uh, helping students learn how to teach science in the elementary mm -hmm. classroom. The last two years, I got back to the field studies course for science teaching. Mm. And we were up in um, northern Baltimore County. And, you know, I pretty much threw my students right in mm -hmm. um, through with the blessing of the, the mentor teachers there. I'm not one to provide model lesson plans. Um, I don't do what the other science educators consider um, traditional scaffolding. Uh, we spend some time deconstructing what they're trying to teach and then rebuilding it up to what they think is you know, most important for kids to know and do. And then I help them learn how to construct meaningful learning experiences. So my approach tries to get them to think about if no matter where they go, they can figure out how to engage kids in meaningful learning experiences. Um, so that, that's kind of my approach. Where does that lead us, um, or where has that led me? It, it's, it's actually led me to frustration. Mm. And it's frustrating because when I was putting material together for a grant proposal that I did not get through the Spencer Foundation, one of my goals would be to do something similar to this, but sit down with real teachers mm -hmm. in the elementary classroom mm -hmm. and find out from their stories, from observing them, how are they successful, quote, successful, and we're not talking MSA successful, right. you know, fifth grade MSA test, Maryland State Assessment Test. But there's, is there any reason to believe that those couldn't happen concurrently? Right, Learn, no. Learning and school, good score on that? Right, no, I agree okay. with you. Um, I mean that exactly. I mean, that's, that's, that's a possible. lot we have. That's possible. Right, and the lot we have is that we, you know, the students take the test and they're supposed to do well. So can we do both? And we should be able to do both. Um, but how do teachers who are considered successful actually doing that? What mm -hmm. are they doing in the classrooms, mm -hmm. in the elementary classrooms to engage kids in science? that actually promote, you know, curiosity, promote interest, promote um, students to do their own investigations and research about pretty much anything. And does that link to higher, you know, we could say, ask the question, does that link to higher test scores with those teachers? Um, but the frustration I have is very much probably when you get a social studies person in here is the fact that, you know, for years the two disciplines are not tested and so the emphasis has not been on them. Mm -hmm. Uh, the other issue is there's this phobia, and we'd have to go back to the, the research literature on it, and I haven't read much lately, but I know back when I was in my doctoral program, um, you have the, um, you know, the stereotypes of science being, you know, hard, science being factual based. Um, the other issue of you know, science being more a pursuit by men, especially the hard sciences and engineering, which is wonderful because we have a female science educator here who's an engineer. Mm -hmm. I joke with her, she's phenomenal, and I joke that she's an anomaly, mm -hmm. a woman scientist and engineer. Mm -hmm. And that women, you know, this idea that women and girls don't pursue science because it's hard, because it's not fun. So, you, you know, you, you, you struggle with that stereotype, and I still see some of that today, not as much. Um, but in part of that links to the, the reason I bring that up is because many of our elementary teachers are women. And so the question is, do we have this societal bias, you know, towards not science? Now, I've taught with a number of, um, taught a number of women, and they're basically sick of the gender bias stuff. They're like, right. I'm tired of this. Don't bring it up anymore. But, and again, I haven't read the re literature recently on that. I think I just thought, saw something that kind of headed down that path. But what's frustrating is, I think, the time, the time in the classroom, uh, the idea that, you know, we don't trust teachers to 
construct their own experiences for kids, especially in science. So we have to sometimes, we have to put kids together. Um, right. That's not to say that there's no, that's not to say a good curriculum isn't useful. There is, you know, no substitute for good curriculum. But can we help teachers learn how to do it without, in the, you know, an absence mm -hmm. of good curriculum? Mm -hmm. So it's frustrating. I would like to go back to something that you said a little bit earlier, I think, um, that talked about um, state assessments, any kind of assessments in science, and that those don't happen early on. Right. Did you say something to that effect? I did. And so um, science isn't evaluated in a standardized, formal kind of way until when? Fifth With grade. Fifth grade, and is that math then, or do you also get, do you actually get some kind of other assessment other than math? Well, and, and let's see, it's the No Child Left Behind right. Act, which brought in literacy and mathematics from grade three all right. the way through. And right. then science starts at five, and five. I think it goes to eight. It skips okay. over six and seven. I could be wrong. And, you know, obviously that's something I should know, right? Uh -huh. Don't put that on the tape. <laughs> but we're doing, but we do do math earlier. Yes, yes. Math right along with um, grade three. Yeah. Right along with literacy. Right. But it's an interesting consideration. Yeah. What right. does that say about our sense of science and when science education begins if we're not evaluating it to fifth grade, until fifth grade. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean I'm a firm... We're doing reading in first. Right. We're doing math, well, both of them by third. So um, I'm wondering what the thinking is there and why we aren't examining that earlier. Probably the wrong person to ask, ask our national policy and our state policy <laughs> um, people. I'm a firm believer of what um, Harold Pratt, he, and I, I have the citation somewhere, he did a congressional hearing. He was okay. a former um, president of National Science Teachers Association, uh -huh. and I think it was 2010 he did the hearing. And he clearly told anybody who would listen to him that it's a, it's a complete fallacy to think that st when we neglect science at the elementary levels, students can catch up at middle school, middle level and higher. Uh -huh. He says that's just, a, he, this is not a quote, but he's basically saying it's absurd to have that thinking, that we can catch up. And that today's push for STEM education, for example, the university is pushing for STEM education. They have the yes. UTeach program where they want to have math and science majors get involved in schools to potentially consider teaching as a career. And, and I agree with what Harold Pratt would say, is that where we really need to get people's interest in teaching and, and really being highly motivated, particularly for science, is in the elementary grades. Mm -hmm. If we don't do it at the elementary grades, they're not really going to catch up in the middle and high school. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's the thing that's, to me, s unfortunate. That's that we're not doing, we're, and again, does that mean we have to test it? Seems to be the only way to get something emphasized. But we're not do even doing that until no. fifth grade. Right. Uh, I had an opportunity to read your chapter in your new book, and um, there are two things in there, of course. One of them that interests me, the whole book, is this, this idea, this concept of narrative and um, teacher lore in teacher preparation. And the second piece was the response to your students, your who are preparing to be elementary teachers in terms of having to take on teaching science. Um, and it seemed to me, as I was reading the, the second part, their response to teaching science, seemed to echo all the things that you've said here in terms of this inherent, it's not inherent, but early, early on sense that science is difficult and and something that they would prefer not to have to deal with. Um, just like you to talk a little bit about that, and that piece of it. And the second thing, of course, is for you to talk a little bit about how you've used narrative in your teaching, in your 
helping to prepare right. teachers to become teachers. So first thing, maybe, uh, it, it's, it would appear to me from having read this that we still have young women, especially, who are the overwhelming majority right. of our elementary teachers, right. apprehensive about dealing with science. Right. And what's interesting is that's probably, you know, the first thing I should try to get, get from that. I used to do a uh, um, reflective piece, not even a reflective piece, a piece of answering a prompt, teaching as sciences, teaching sciences. And I, I stopped doing that um, for a variety of reasons, probably because I just forgot. But a lot of times teaching was, you know, the beautiful um, job. Science was, you know, boring, the hard facts. Teaching science is tough. I didn't always get that from, from the women. Um, and the women, not all of them are adverse to science. I mean, I've got this, this one student who's wonderful. She actually sh she shows cows. She's a national <laughs> champion in showing cows. And, and talk about a place to learn about science. Uh -huh. You have to raise the animal. Um, if you did read that, which, which it clearly came out in the students' comments, and it comes out almost all the time, I am nervous yes, about teaching initially. science. Yep. Right. And then I actually have a title of a book that some is in my head, which may never come out. It's a curriculum book. It's called It's Not Rocket Science. Through engaging them um, in taken the content and integrated it to active learning. They also had the luxury of having my colleague, Adam Frederick, as their um, life science teacher. Uh -huh. um, so they were immersed in content in a very exciting way, very much like the Stephen Brown that I mentioned from my college experience. Uh -huh. um, they actually saw that science was a lot more accessible than what they initially thought especially at the elementary level, um, and especially with this notion, and we, we push this notion inside out, especially if you open your doors and open your eyes and get kids to look at the world around them, there's a lot going on, um, and it's not inaccessible. Now, some would argue that if you open your doors in an urban school where there's glass on the blacktop or all the grass is, um, and I've seen this in schools, um, that's an issue, or we're not, not going to let kids out because our neighborhood's dangerous. Um, but they came out of it, definitely, and most of them do come out of it, with this notion like, wow, I can do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, you know, that's no, no small... No. It's a big deal. I remember doing this in Chicago. And, you know, I told my students, I said, you know, I, all I'm trying to get you to do in 14 weeks is to, <laughs> and no small task, but to get you, to show you that you can actually teach science to elementary kids. Uh -huh. And it doesn't have to be rocket science. You don't have right. to be an expert in all the science content. You will have to spend some time learning it. And you may actually enjoy it. You might like it. You know, some of them don't. They don't like science. Okay, that's fine. Um, that happens. And then the use of narrative. I came around, I came onto this a long time ago. The teacher lore, which was 1992, I think Bill Schubert and Bill Ayers put mm -hmm. that out. And what's funny is I'm now coming back to the, using the term lore because narrative is so, has become so part of our societal conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, what's Barack Obama's narrative? What's this narrative? What's that? That it's almost passe. So... Um, started in 97 pretty much with narratives with the idea and, and I've always had pre-service interns tell me this that yeah I'd love to hear stories from people who have come before me I'd love to hear about their experiences I'd love to hear about what they went through in order to learn how to become a teacher so the book you just read while the way it's structured this goes back to my you know the idea that I, I wanted everything to be perfect it's a good start Mm -hmm. But there's more, there, ideally mm -hmm. there's more to come. Of course. Um, this one looked at education in different disciplines. Mm -hmm. I just happen to used to do science. But I think you can learn a lot from the students in terms about how they want to go about being taught. But at the same time, I think the students, students can learn a lot about themselves when they either reread or share their experiences with others, which I think you know, my perspective is foundational to what you're doing here as an oral history project. 
what are we going to learn about Towson University, Towson mm -hmm. State College, Towson Normal School right. that we may not have known or that we did know but we forgot? <clears throat> or what do individuals who are preparing to become teachers and then become teachers, right. in, in retrospect, what do they see as their most valuable experience in helping them to be, become good teachers right. and to view themselves in that regard. Right. Yeah. And that goes, but you know, and it goes back to what we talked about in terms of that's that middle area. Yeah. What happens? What happens in the middle area? You know, the, the notion of what's going on in the classroom. And it's interesting. I always went into this profession with a PhD of thinking that teachers and I are equal. You know, the mm -hmm. traditional mm -hmm. ivory tower, mm -hmm. and we, we tell them what to mm -hmm. do. We're equal. And we have certainly a variety. I mean, I have my own slants. I have my own um, way of looking at things and my own luxuries of being able to sit in a classroom and not be a participant observer, be a passive observer. You can't do that. But you have your own expertise, your own professional knowledge base. You have a wealth of information that you can share with us. And even pre-service teachers mm -hmm. um, can learn from their own experiences. Absolutely. So that's the reason why I pursued the narrative. Uh -huh. um, not to be Jerry Springer type. And part <laughs> of the situation in our life right now is my wife makes, doesn't make fun of me. I'm not a blog reader. Uh -huh. um, and sometimes I get a little annoyed that we now, we're now in a world where everybody's opinion matters or everybody has an opinion, kind of like, you know, belly button or so that kind of that kind of counters my notion that the power of narratives. <laughs> so I have to, you know, what what what's the word? I'm a hypocrite. But I no, think in you're it, a learner. I think in the profession, I think something like this. I think if we focus on what teachers are telling us, there's a lot we can learn. If we have a minute left, would you comment on um, what words of wisdom you might provide to? individuals who are considering teaching as a career? Yeah, individual, you know, it's, um, it, and it's, a, it, it's an extremely difficult job, but it really is rewarding. You have to find your niche. Um, I think you lead with your passion. It's definitely, it's definitely a profession that I think if, you're, if you really want to be happy and successful, you have to have a passion for it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not it's not the type of pr profession where it's just a job mm -hmm. it becomes your life um, I use the example of I look at the world now through the lens of a science educator and I'll sit at you know Christmas dinner with a um, centerpiece that has different um, pine needles in there <laughs> and I start looking at the pine needles and start thinking of a classification activity and I tell my students that, that that's the world you're going to start looking that's the lens you're going to start looking at the world through. So it's, it really is the passion mm -hmm. and the fact that you really got to like kids. Contrary to popular belief, you know, when you go to an interview, why do you want to become a teacher? I love kids. My opinion, that's the first thing you should say. I absolute, absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely love kids and like helping them learn and like being around them. So, I mean, especially elementary. And if you've got that, it's a, great, it's a great career, regardless of how you're treated or how the public perceives you or whatever else happens. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very and much. Thank you for talking with us. I appreciate the opportunity.